Welcome to Spruce Grove Alliance Church, your home. But today, uh, we are going to conclude our series on identity uh, called Banners, and we're going to be coming around the, the table here today. And remember, this series is, is based on this verse, let him lead me to the banquet table and let his banner over me be love. And we're learning and feeling what it means to sit under the banner of God's love, just like Benny was saying there. And we've been talking about these false banners that we put over our head that are different from the love of God. And those false banners, when we put it over our head, we, they, they have a lot of power over our lives. And so the false banner, as we come around the communion table today, that I want to address is this banner of worthless or insignificant, that I have no value in God's eyes. If I had a dime <laughs> for every time I saw that in, in someone's life, and I saw them living that out in, 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 in these unconscious coping mechanisms, worthless. Have you ever had this happen to you? Where you are in a social gathering, and there's lots of conversation happening, and maybe you're engaged in a conversation, and then all of a sudden, you kind of zone out. And your eyes get really big and you stare at one little spot and for like 20 or 30 seconds you leave planet earth and you're thinking about something else and then something breaks you out of this and it's usually fingers snapping right in front of you like this, earth to Brent, earth to Brent, we lost you there for a second. How many has ever that ever happened to you? How many of you have ever seen someone in a meeting or in church or, or something where, where they're just zoning out and then somebody's like, earth to Brent, earth to Brent, right? No, often we can feel like that in our relationship with God. Like, yeah, okay, we know God is in control and he is... He, he runs the universe and he, 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 he sees everything, but, but sometimes it feels like in your situation, you're like, earth to God, earth to God. Eh, eh. Does anyone ever felt like that? You're like, like earth to God, are you, are you zoned out here for a second? Do you see what's going on in my life? And if you've been a follower of God for any length of time, you live with this tension. And it's this tension that, 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 that God Sometimes it's like, hey, earth to God, but, but sometimes also he's concerned about the very minutia of our lives as well. Maybe even some things that don't really even matter. Um, I, uh, I work out at the Tri-Leisure every, every week, about three times a week. I see some of you guys there. And uh, I have a monthly membership, and they give you this, this rubber bracelet uh, so that when you go in, you don't have to wait in line and pay money. You can, it's kind of an express line. You just beep, and then uh, run to the scanner, and then you can go right in. And so this particular day, I was in a bit of a hurry, and I ran in, and bleep, and I run upstairs, and I, I go get changed into my gym gear. And then for the life of me, I could not find this bracelet. And, and I tore everything apart in my gym bag and in my pockets and every, looked all over the place three times over, and you've done this, and, and I can't find the thing. And I said, I just had it. I just had it. I beeped in, and I came up, and I, I changed, and now I can't find it. And so then I go down, downstairs to the main desk, and I said, I just beeped in here, and I, I, I can't find my bracelet. Did anyone turn in a bracelet? Maybe I dropped it, and they look all over. No, no, he turned in a bracelet. So here's what we'll do. They said, we'll give you just a paper bracelet bracelet, a disposable one, and, and go do your workout, and maybe someone will pass it in and come back here after your workout. And I'm like, oh, okay, that sounds good. So I, I get my paper bracelet, and I go up, and I usually work, uh, work out in, in the track upstairs there, and they get all this exercise equipment around the outside. And as I was like nearing the end of about three quarters of the way done my, my, my workout, I, I noticed on the track, like all these people are walking and running by, I noticed on the track there was, there was a $5 bill like a crisp $5 bill just standing straight up. I was like, oh, I, was like, I pick it up. And then I spent the next 15 minutes as I was like working out and, and in between sets as people walked by, I was like, did you lose $5? Did you lose $5? Did you lose $5? Did you lose $5? I went all the way down this way. Everyone was working out this way and everyone working. Did you, did you? No, nobody wanted this $5. No, no, it's not mine. It's not mine. Not mine. I guess it's yours, bud. And so I, I'm just about done my, my workout and so I take this, this $5 bill down to the main desk. 
And I explained the whole situation, like, I found this $5 on the track, and nobody could claim it. I asked everyone up there, here, why don't you take it in case somebody comes back here? And I said, you know, they lost $5. And it was one of those conversations where like, no, you, I don't want you take it, you take it, you take it, you take it. And she's like, I'm not taking money. It's just $5. You take it, you take it. And so finally I was like, okay, I tried, God. I tried, I tried. Uh, and so I'm holding this $5. And I said, well, on another note, another note, um, did anyone turn in a bracelet? And uh, no, 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 looked all over, no, no bracelet. Well, I said, what would I do? Can I, can I get another bracelet? And she's like, yeah, yeah, okay, what we'll do, we have to decommission your old one. She's just clickety-clickety on the computer, and okay, yeah, you know, just in case somebody doesn't want to, you know, use it in your name, and okay, decommission that one, and we got to get you a new one. She pulls another one out, and she, and she says, okay, a new one will be $5. Can you, can you do that with my mortgage? <laughs> uh, I mean, we got, we got a community life center over there, and it's 1.5 million. I mean, it's not five bucks, but how about this, this snarl in my life, God? Can, uh, can you, like, you ever live with that, this tension that every once in a while, God is concerned about the very minute details of your life, but then other times it's like, Earth to God, Earth to God, eh, eh, I need a little bit more than $5 here, right? Have you ever lived with that tension? Well, 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 when that happens, it feels like God's indifferent to us. It feels like, like God doesn't care about us, and we feel insignificant. We feel like we don't have any value. We feel like we are worthless. And, and, and the text today in Ephesians chapter 1, where we're going to go here, addresses those who feel like God is indifferent towards them. And it feels, it feels, so therefore they feel like they, they don't have any value. They feel that worthless. And you're like, earth to God, earth to God, pay attention here. I could use a little bit more than that $5 thing. And, 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 and when, when we get to Ephesians here, this is written by a guy named Paul. And Paul, when he, it, when he writes this, he's in prison. And he is in a place in his life, just think about this. Have you ever, you know, he's in a place in his life where, where most of us would be, uh, earth to God, earth to God, I could, I could use that whole $5 thing here in my life right now. But he doesn't. He doesn't even talk about that. He doesn't even talk about the, the $5. Instead, he talks about something different. He talks in Ephesians chapter 1 and chapter 2 about these, this rich inheritance, this incomparable riches, these spiritual riches. Five times, in fact, in the first two chapters, he talks about these riches of God's grace that he's lavished upon us, the deposit guaranteeing an inheritance, the riches of God's glorious inheritance. He's rich in mercy, the incomparable riches of his grace. And so Paul is trying to say to those who feel like they have no worth or significance, no, 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 he's saying God has placed something of priceless, extravagant, eternal wealth inside of you. In, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, there's this other illustration. We're not going to go there. We're going to go to Ephesians 1. But there's this other illustration that Paul uses. He says, we, uh, we have this treasure in jars of clay. Just an ordinary common dish. That's what we are. And we, he's given us this three million dollar diamond or seven dollars on Amazon. <laughs> this treasure of immense value and he has placed it in us. And so he says, if you, if you feel significant and insignificant and worthless, like you have no value, Paul's trying to tell us here, wait a second, you have an enormous amount of value. And, 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 and if you've... Uh, if you watch these banking commercials, Scotiabank, Paul's trying to say, if you feel worthless, no, no, you're richer than you think. You're richer than you think, spiritually. And, and, and Paul is so excited at the beginning of this passage of, the, of, of in Ephesians to talk about this priceless, eternal, extravagant treasure that he has placed inside of us, that he is a volcano at the very beginning. And the first sentence, well, the second sentence, from chapter 1, verse 3 to 14, those 11 verses 
in the Greek is one long run-on sentence. He would have got an A plus in theology and an F minus in language arts. His English teacher would have bludgeoned that. And he's so excited to get this out. He's like my, like my daughter when she comes back from Bible camp this past summer and she's, just, she, she, she's speaking in fragmented sentences. We did this and we did this again. We did these games and we did this and we learned this and we made these friends. And oh yeah, this applies to this and oh that. Let me pick up the story back here. And he's just trying to get it all out. He's just so excited that, that, that he can't contain himself. He's like a volcano. He runs through all of the stop signs. No periods whatsoever in the Greek. Now the English translation, you're going to see that there is some periods. Thankfully, the translators did put it in there but he's so excited to tell someone who feels like they are worthless and they have no value though no 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 you're richer than you think let me show you how <laughs> so here we go paul an apostle of christ jesus by the will of god to god's holy people in ephesus the faithful in christ jesus grace and peace to you from god our father and lord jesus christ here we go Okay, got the introductions out of the way, Paul says. Hold on, this is one long sentence. There's a lot packed in here. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. In accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reached their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven, on earth, under Christ." In him we are also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity to the purpose of his will, in order that we who are the first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were in Christ when you, when, when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you believed you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Whew. Earth to Spruce Grove Alliance, come back to me. Come back to me. Isn't there a lot in there? Uh, we're getting into uh, Christmas season here really soon. How many like fruitcake? How many loathe fruitcake? Yes. I often wonder why they call it fruitcake because, uh, as my kid son said when he was little, like, there's, I like the bread part of the cake. Like, and there's hardly any of the bread part in the cake. It's like, how much stuff can you pack into something and still call it cake? Like, there's raisins and walnuts and dates and cherries and, I don't know, tofu and the kitchen sink, whatever. You just pack that. How much stuff's in your cupboard? You just pack it in there and then still call it cake versus angel food cake, right? Which is just light and fluffy and airy. You chew on it, chew on it and it feels like you've eaten nothing. And, and so this, this passage right here, this one long on, run on sentence is theologically dense. There is a lot in here. And we're not going to be able to taste all of the nuances of this fruit cake. It, it is theologically dense. And so if it felt like, oh, okay, you want to spit out this fruit cake because it is so dense, let me turn it into angel food cake here for a moment. Combating this false banner of worthless and insignificant is about understanding God's possession and God's pleasure. It's about understanding God's possession and God's pleasure. It's not about more self-love. That's what our society will tell us. You just need to love yourself. No, 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 no. You, you don't have anything to give yourself. It's about understanding the rich treasure that God has given you, the love that he is giving you. That's what shapes your identity. That is what will shape all of us. So let's take a few bites of this fruitcake, but we're not gonna be able to taste every nuance. God's possession means that we are chosen. 
chosen. It says, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything for the conformity of the purpose of his will. Now, this whole concept of does God choose me or do I choose God, Calvinism versus Arminianism, it's traditionally called in the evangelical world, there has been oceans of ink spilt over this. And every time that we jump into this discussion, does God choose me or do I choose God, I always think of Sesame Street when I was a kid and there were those alien puppets and, and they go, yip, 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 uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Hey, come on, help me out. Everyone over 40 know this? Yip, 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 uh-huh, uh-huh. Does God choose me or do I choose God? Yip, 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 uh-huh, uh-huh. Yes, 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 you do. Uh, I don't know a lot about vehicles, but I do know this, okay? That you can stall the engine if you flood it. If you send too much gasoline to the engine at once, you're going to stall the engine. And that's what happens intellectually when we try to solve this whole conundrum of does God choose me or do I choose God? It ends up stalling us intellectually and we just go, you know, we can't move. And Paul is not interested in stalling our faith. Paul is no interested in, in, in us getting into this intellectual conundrum in this whole thing and stalling our faith and flooding our... He wants to flood our hearts with the emotion of this. I'm always telling people, not what is the text saying, but what is the text doing? It's living and active. The Holy Spirit is in this. It's doing something in your heart. As you read this, what is this text doing? Paul, when he talks about this whole thing about chosen, predestined election, is trying to overwhelm us with the sense that who are we that God would even choose us and look at us and choose to give us something so amazing? Who are we? Now, how many here, uh, when, when it comes to vacations, are a planner or a seat of the pantser? How many... How many, when it comes to vacations, you like to plan everything out? You, you have all of the hotels booked. You even have your meals booked. You have potty breaks along the way booked. You know all of the times you're going to smile and be sad, and you have it all planned out, right? Now, now how many of you are just like, we're going to go that way at the road, and just, if anything shiny attracts, you know, we're, we're just going to stop and look at it. How many, how many are like the seat of the pants? How many married someone the complete opposite to them? Isn't God awesome? He's just going to transform you in, in all this? No? Okay. Uh, no offense to those who are the seat of their pantsers when it comes to vacation planning. But when it comes to the plan of salvation, God is not doing it by the seat of his pants. He, 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 salvation was not some last minute seat of the pants, ill-conceived, haphazard rescue operation, but part of an eternal, purposeful, designed plan. It wasn't as if God was out there expanding infinity and he was so stressed out and he was trying to keep a septillion of stars from hitting one another and it's just hard and it's like, how do you keep all this in play? And, and, then, and he created earth in the middle of that and he put humans on it and then one, one day, uh, you know, Jesus taps him on the shoulder, he goes, they eat the fruit. And God's like, oh myself, <laughs> holy me, what am I gonna do? I didn't see this coming. I'm so busy. I expand in infinity. It's so hard out here. Just lose all these gaseous balls. I keep hitting one another. Do you know how hard that is? What are we going to do? Oh, myself. They ate the fruit. They did something they were, I told them not to explicitly. What are we going to do? Jesus, you doing anything? Why don't you just go talk to them? Tell them some stories about me, you know? You know, smooth things over. And, and you go down there, I mean, it's December 25th, almost, you, trip for your birthday, and head down there, and just talk to them. I gotta expand infinity out here, I'm so stressed. And, he's, and then he keeps doing all this, and then all of a sudden the Holy Spirit taps him on the shoulder, and he's like, he's like they killed him. Oh, myself, <laughs> holy me, are you kidding me? They killed Jesus, what are we gonna do? Ah, oh, I don't know, what are we, what are we gonna do? What are we, why don't, um, I know we're God. Let's raise him from the dead. We'll tell them that was the plan all along. They'll write 
sing songs about it. They'll, they'll write books about it. And Jesus, you kind of just come up here um, and tell them you'll be back. Be very ambiguous about when you're coming back, you know, um, and, and just buy some time here. i got to expand infinity out here. This is, this is so hard. This is so hard. And, and, and maybe we'll send the Holy Spirit. He's a ghost. They can't kill him anyway. So uh, are you picking up what I'm putting down? I tell my preachers that sometimes the best way to illustrate something is by contrast. Like, like the plan of salvation was not some seat of the pants, haphazard, ill-conceived, make-it-up-as-you-go plan. That's, that's what they call open theism. Open theism is the, is the concept that, that God created the world and just kind of shrugged his shoulders and said, I don't know. I'm along for the ride too. I don't know how this is going to turn out. But Paul, when he talks about this thing that we are chosen, we are predestined, we are elected, elected, wants us to be overwhelmed with the fact that before the creation of the world, God looked into the future and he saw you and he saw me in the mess of our sin. And he devised a plan in that moment so that we, through his son, could be holy and blameless in his sight, because we're not holy. That before he said, let there be light, he knew that you and I were going to choose darkness, and that he was going to devise a plan through his own son, so that he could give us light, so that he could be in union with us. And that is what Paul wants to overwhelm us with. He doesn't want us to stall our faith and, oh, does God choose me? Yep, 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 uh uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay. No, 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 no. He wants you to understand that before he even said, let there be light, he knew you were going to choose darkness, and he made a way for you to come to him and be overwhelmed with that. And it's all in accordance of the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. Paul is saying, you're richer than you think. Despite whether that $5 thing happens, you're richer than you think. But then he keeps building on this concept that you're God's possession. Not only are you God's possession, but you are adopted as a child. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with the pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. So it's this idea that, that, that redeemed means purchased by payment of a price, and in those days it was usually purchasing a slave. So we were in a slave to something called our sin, and he purchased us and then adopted us as his child. And all throughout this passage, if you noticed it, there was this, there's, this, there's this phrase, in Christ, through Christ, by him. 36 times in the book of Ephesians and 11 times in this passage, it's about in being in Christ. And here is the most amazing thing about the gospel that Paul is insatiably consumed about. That when we unite ourselves to Jesus, the Son, by our faith, God looks at us and he sees his son. Do you understand that? So that when Jesus was here on this earth, we heard the Father speak to the Son two times from heaven when he was not expanding infinity. And he says, this is my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. And we can hear that from the Father if we're in the Son. Nepotism is part of our DNA showing favor to our family members, especially our kids. Nepotism is part of our DNA because we are made in the image of God. And it's part of the DNA of the Trinity, the Father and the Son. The Father loves the Son. Father has all of his favor showing to the Son. Uh, In two weeks on December the 10th, you're going to see nepotism in this room. It's called a Christmas concert. We use nepotism to build the church you can, <laughs> unapologetically, people won't come and hear the gospel. You put their kid on stage, everyone in their family shows up and they get cameras like this and they're listening, they're paying attention, right? I remember uh, when my son was really small and we were at Briarcrest, 
And I'm trying to zoom in there. There he is right there. This is a picture that means nothing to you, but means everything to me. There he is. There he is right in the middle. And I zoom it right in. Oh, there, there he is right there. <laughs> that means nothing to you. That'll go on my fridge. That'll go on my Facebook feed. And it means nothing to you, but it's for me, right? And, and there he is doing his actions, right? Every time <laughs> I use my kids in the sermon, by the way, I owe the McDonald's. Um, this next video is going to cost me the keg. <laughs> and so here he is. I'm zoomed in. There he is with a blue kite right there. I didn't tuck his shirt in. <laughs> and this is a Christmas concert. And he's, isn't he cute? Isn't he amazing? Isn't this the best ever? Look at those kite skills. Look at that. I taught him everything he knows. And then I look at him and rub his nose there. Isn't that cute? Right? And like, there's 100 people on stage at this place, and I'm focused on one. Oh, I'm focused on one. It's my son. And so the most amazing thing of the gospel is that when we unite ourselves to Jesus by our faith, that all of the favor, all of the thought, all of the attention, all of the grace, all of the love that the Father would pour into his own son, it comes to us. We are his adopted child. So we're his chosen adopted child before the beginning of creation. And then he goes on later in Ephesians chapter 2, and he says, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. So in Christ, Christ in us and us in Christ, we participate in the death the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus. He's at the right hand of the Father where he can show, give, show us all the kindness and all the resources that we need. Paul's trying to tell us here, you're, you're richer than you think. <laughs> but not only are we God's possession, we're chosen and adopted, but we are sealed. In him you are marked. You were marked in him with the seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is the deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. There's the word. We are God's possession because of the Holy Spirit in, inside of us. Now, we know how a deposit works. Even back in those days, a deposit, if you're going to purchase a home, you're going to purchase a, make a significant purchase, a vehicle or something, you're going to ask for a deposit. It's about $5,000. On a $500,000 home, it's a, it, 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 it's a promise that there's more money coming late at a later date, an astronomical amount of more money coming. So God gives us his eternal presence on the inside right now, a small amount of his presence now, promising an enormous amount of his presence coming later. And a deposit does this. A deposit shows seriousness. That's so why when you go buy a vehicle, they're just wanting that deposit. Once they got that de non-refundable deposit, you know, they know they got you, Right? And it claims ownership. No one else can take that. This is yours. When I, when I was a youth pastor, we used to take trips from Moncton down to the New England, New York, Boston, Hartford. We used to take trips to go see uh, Christian concerts, and I'd fill a big bus, and it would be like 300 bucks a kid. Who wants to go? I do, I do. You know, 400 hands go up. I do, not that many. But I, I want to go, I want to go. Well, you give me a deposit, $100, your seat is locked in. You own it. You know, no one else can take it from you because we all know Everyone's going to promise it, and then the last minute you're going to be like, yeah, I don't know, my friends are doing something, now they're more cool. right? I know that never happens with teenagers, but <laughs> we were all there once. We were all there once. But a deposit shows seriousness. A deposit claims ownership. And Paul wants us to understand this about the Holy Spirit, that God is so seriously committed to you that he has literally deposited himself inside of you, his eternal presence inside of you. And he's not going to walk away from you and forget about you. Last minute, he's not going to go, I don't know if I want them. No, he, no he's already committed. He has, he, he's chosen you. He's adopted you as a child, and he's sealed the deal. and says, this is mine. I put my eternal presence on the inside. And the most amazing thing about all of this, and you've got to circle this in this whole passage, two times it says, according to his good pleasure. He did it with a smile on his face. 
before the creation of the world. He thought of you and your sin, and he provided a way through his son so that you could be close to him and holy and blameless in his sight. He adopted you. You were a slave to sin. He adopted you, made you his child, poured his resources in you, and they poured his very presence inside of you by his Holy Spirit, and he did it with a smile on his face. Isn't that amazing? We have this treasure in jars of clay. You know, a a jar of clay is basically a a common dish, an ordinary dish in those days. You would put food in it, you'd put water in it, you'd store stuff in it, you'd carry stuff in it, grain or whatever. Um, It's just like a a plate or a bowl. I mean, how how many plates or bowls would be represented in this room? If I went to your home, would you have, what, 50 plates and bowls? Maybe more than that, 100? If you have stuff in the basement, you don't know? Like, you know... I would venture to say there's more, there's more dishes on this planet than there are people, right? And, and, and it's worth a few dollars, maybe. It's rather insignificant. It's not worth, there's not a lot of value to them. If you break it, it's not like, oh, no. Like, if you smash your car, that's, oh, no. Like, but if you break one of these, you just, you just buy another one. It's only worth a few dollars. It's, it's insignificant. And, and Paul wants us to see here that he saw us, and we were insignificant, and we were, didn't have any value. Maybe we were worthless, and he put something of significance inside of us, his very presence, and he did it with a smile on his face. Wow. You know, every single one of us who are, have the Holy Spirit inside of them have those moments in their lives where I like to call them, that wasn't me. Have you ever had those? Like, I went through that season in my life and I should have acted like this, but I acted instead like peaceful, calm, empowered. That wasn't me. Or I, 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 I didn't have the words to say in that moment, but I was given the words to say in that moment, and you go, that wasn't me. What if every time we had that, that wasn't me uh, thing happen, we pictured God just smiling, going, it was me. It's my eternal presence on the inside. How would that shape our identity? Paul's trying to tell us, you're richer than you think. You're richer than you think. I know we're heading into the Christmas season and then into January, and we're going to be, I'm going to be asking you to select a vision verse for 2024. Maybe your vision verse for 2024 is to chew on this theological dense, theologically dense sentence every single day and taste something new about your identity, of who you are in Christ. And every day you're going to taste some new thing about your identity. Maybe, maybe, maybe that's what you need to do. Maybe just a portion of it. Let's land the plane at this communion table. See, Paul is so excited to paint this picture of who we are in Christ because he wants us to live from a place of deep security in our identity through all the challenges of life. He wants us to know that we are loved. And we'll come back to this ropes course. It's all about understanding how secure we are in Christ. It's all about understanding that that we are locked in and we are secure. This ropes course was in Nova Scotia a couple summers ago, and my kids love to do this. It's a couple stories, sometimes as high as this is this roof here. Uh, they're up in the trees and they're doing all of these swinging ladders and 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 Tarzan ropes and things like that and zip lines and but it's all safe because they're they're locked in on this cord. There's two back carabiners that lock them in. It's impossible for them to open both at the same time, and so they're locked in. So it's designed that if they slip or whatever, you know, they only fall about six inches. And and and, and Paul is trying to show us here that that, that we are we are locked in and secure. Uh, one of their cousins. Jamie is her name. Um, she, she did one of these black diamond um, ones. And at, at, 
and it was really tough. At the very end, there was this cylinder that they were like probably as high as that roof there. They had to hold on, jump on and hold on to it, go on a, on a zip line, and then, then jump onto a cargo net. And so she's on this platform ready to, to jump onto this cylinder, and I could hear her doing the self-talk on this platform. She kept saying, it's okay. You're locked in. You're secure. It's okay. Jamie, you're locked in. You're secure. It's okay. You're locked in. You're secure. And she did it. She jumped. She held on. And then, and then she jumped and she grabbed that cargo net and she did it. How would we live differently if we knew that through the cross and the resurrection that we were locked in, that we were secure, that no matter if we fall He's got us. That no matter if somebody pushes us, he's got us. That, that, that no matter if we're tired and we can't hold on, that he's got us. That we, we're not sure we can go any farther, that he's got us. That even if that $5 thing doesn't come through, He's got us. Because the banner over us is love. Thanks for listening to this week's message from Spruce Grove Alliance Church. For more information or to hear past messages, please visit sgac.net.